Hello and welcome to this CNBC Africa special debate recorded on the sidelines of the 53rd annual meetings of the African Development Bank in Busan, South Korea, where CNBC Africa's Bronwyn Nelson chaired a high-level panel session on sustainable climate and disaster risk financing in Africa. It is my honor to ask to come to the podium Dr. Akinwumi Adashina, President of the African Development Bank, to start the conversation from the perspective of the African Development Bank when it comes to risk financing. President Adashina. And welcome to this uh, session. Uh, I'm delighted to be here uh, for three reasons. First, because you all that are here care about Africa. That's the first one. The second one is that the future of Africa depends on what decisions we take out of this place. And third is the fact that we need to think of how to actually mobilize resources to deal with the issue of the impact of climate change on Africa. Um, so starting from the first one, if you just take a look at what has happened with regard to, to Africa, Africa contributes no more than 2-3% of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the world. But Africa suffers disproportionately from the negative impacts of that. All across Africa, you see a lot more today, a lot more frequency of droughts, and in fact, a lot of flash floods that you see that decimate a lot of our countries. And so the question really is this. How do we square it that the continent that, doesn't, that contributes the least to the impact of greenhouse gas emissions is being left to suffer disproportionately? I happen to have been at the forefront of discussions that were held during the Paris uh, COP21. And one of the things that was agreed during the COP21 was that we will look at two things. First, we will look at the issue of climate adaptation, I mean, mitigation, and that we will look then about the issue of climate adaptation. We were all very, very excited. And in particular, all of the African delegation, we felt so excited because our problem really wasn't much about the issue of the mitigation. Our problem was in with the issue of adaptation. Now, what was promised was that there was a promise of $100 billion a year that will be made available to cope with the whole issue of the impacts of climate change around the world. And we were looking forward to a lot of those resources coming to Africa to help African countries to adapt. Think about the coastal countries that today have been literally uh, on say, in, in Francais, they say, bouleversé, you know, all over the place. You look at the blue economy being negatively impacted because of lack of financing. But the money isn't coming. And the floods aren't stopping. And the droughts aren't stopping. You take a look at the East and Southern African area that have been very badly affected by the impact of droughts. I remember going to, um, to, to, to uh, Malawi, and I had gone on a state visit there, and I was on my way to the airport. And I just said, I saw the maize field, and I said, stop. And I created some confusion with the order of the, of the, of the convoy. I wanted to go, and I went straight into the cornfield, and I tried to take the maize cob in my hand. It was shriveled. It was nothing. The farmers had lost every single thing. And such is the impact of climate change on the lives and livelihoods of millions and millions in Africa. I believe that it's time to change that. Because the fact of the matter is that lives are just been badly affected. So I believe, therefore, from where I started, that Africa that has been shortchanged by climate change should not be shortchanged by climate finance. And therefore, we need to have instruments that allows us to do that. I am delighted that Dr. Nkoji, uh, uh, Ngozi Okonjo-Nwela is the chairperson of the Africa Risk Capacity. Uh, Mohammed, my, uh, my brother, is here. The Africa Risk Capacity is that instrument that allows us to transfer the risk through a market mechanism to self-insure the countries against this catastrophic risks, these extreme weather patterns that I have painted to you. The challenge is, it works. I mean, the opportunity is it works. There have been a few countries, they will tell you, 
about the countries that have subscribed to the Africa Risk Capacity Insurance Mechanism, and they've been able to get payouts that have allowed them to cope in the case of disasters. But 10 countries is not enough, 11 countries is not enough. We want all of African countries to be insured. And so the issue is who pays the insurance premium? It's the payment of the premium that matters. And I think that it is behoves on the international community and all of us collectively to make sure that we have pools of financing that will allow the countries to be able to have access to resources to pay for those premiums. I stand up this afternoon to give the 100% support of the African Development Bank behind the Africa Risk Capacity. I also stand up to give the 100% support of the African Development Bank behind the communities and the populations that are going to benefit from the impact of a success of the Africa Risk Capacity. And I know that success is not just about the African Development Bank. We want more stakeholders. We want a lot of our partners to join us in this collective effort to make sure that financing facility is there to allow African countries to benefit from this great initiative that we have that has been working very, very well. As I say, let me close. The future depends on the actions we take today. And we have to have a sense of urgency. I am convinced that if we form the alliances and the partnerships necessary to find those financing, to allow countries to be able to insure themselves against these extreme weather patterns, Africa will be more resilient. And when we talk about integrating Africa, we cannot integrate countries that are fragile. You can only integrate countries that are resilient. And I think that this work, if well supported, will help to bring that economic resiliency that Africa badly needs. Thank you very much, and let's make it happen. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you very much, President Adashina. It is now my pleasure to welcome up to the podium Dr. Ngozi okonjo Wela, Chairperson of the Governing Board of African Risk Capacity, otherwise known as ARC. Madam. Thank you, Bronwyn, and uh, thank you so much to the President of the African Development Bank who found the time to come here to join us on this very top important topic. I'll just continue from where he left off to say that the phenomenon that he talked about, climate change, weather-based events, are truly undermining Africa's development and the hard-won development gains that we've made on the continent. According to the World Bank, global economic losses due to adverse natural events were estimated at $4.2 trillion between 1980 and 2014. These losses increased rapidly rising from 50 billion a year in the 1980s to nearly 200 billion a year in the last decade, and now on average stand at about $300 billion a year. Their report on shockwaves managing the impact of climate change on poverty finds that almost 75% of these losses are attributable to extreme weather events and that climate change threatens to push an additional 100 million people into extreme poverty by 2030. And this is measured against the UN OCHA Global Humanitarian Overview for 2018, which calls for $25.3 billion to provide urgent assistance and protection to 91 million of the most vulnerable of these people. It's important to note that 13 of the top 21 countries that require immediate assistance are in Africa. And the trend is that traditional humanitarian support will, will continue to decline. So it's in this context of the weather-based events, the climate change events, the impact on drought, such as the one that Dr. Adeshina mentioned when he went to Malawi, and we all know it in many of our countries, Against this backdrop, the African Union decided in, in 2012 to form this organization called the African Risk Capacity. It was established by treaty as a specialized agency of the African Union 
to help member states improve their capacities to better plan, prepare, and respond to extreme weather events and natural disasters, thereby protecting food security of their vulnerable populations. Now, by linking early warning systems with contingency planning and supported by modern financial mechanisms, that is the insurance aspect, the African risk capacity enables governments to provide targeted responses to disasters in a more timely, cost-effective, objective and transparent manner, thereby re reducing the response cost to governments and reducing the loss of livelihoods. So the rationale of, of ACK, which we are trying to explain to you today, and the concept is based on the fact that responding earlier to a disaster before it mushrooms into a crisis is financially more efficient and economical and saves more lives and livelihoods. We found through our studies that $1 spent on early intervention through the African Risk Capacity saves nearly $4.5 spent after a crisis is allowed to evolve. This is a good rate of return. And such an approach of planning early, preventing, not allowing a full-fledged crisis to evolve is one of the aspects of building re resilience that the president of DFDB talked about. But ultimately, let me say that my team and I and Mohamed Biavogui, the CEO, and Dolly Kabanda, the CEO of the insurance agency, are also here. We really believe that the African risk capacity is ultimately about African countries taking charge of their own issues and finding a way to finance their own response and ensuring their broader resilience to development. We cannot continue to be a continent that continuously depends on the generosity of others, of the broader community. And it's in this respect that we are so delighted about the robust support of the African Development Bank team from the president to the vice president, uh, Jennifer, who is there to Atsuko, the entire team has come behind us. So let me just update you and say that the ARC establishment agreement has been signed by 33 of our countries on the continent. And in 2014, we established the insurance agency, which is licensed as a mutual insurer. We do have our supporters, our partners from outside, and we are grateful to them. The governments of Germany and the United Kingdom have committed 200 million US dollars in risk capital through a 20-year no-interest loan, of which they've already disbursed 90 million to help the shore up the agency. Now, we have 33 countries signed up, but to date, just eight have participated in the drought risk pool. But these eight countries have paid 54 million dollars to transfer their drought risk through this facility. And 95% of this premium has been sourced through the national budgets. We are very proud of this. This is the only organization among all those doing weather-based insurance where people, monies are coming from our own resources. And that's why we want to promote it. This is what we are all talking about, relying on ourselves. Based on this premium, we've been able to underwrite over US $400 million of drought risk over the four years of operation. And this has provided indirectly an estimated cover to approximately 9.7 million Africans with insurance. In the four years, we've also made payments of over US $36 million to four countries whose policies were triggered. And these resources have gone directly towards helping 2.1 million people and over 1.4 uh, over 1 million livestock. Now it's important to dwell a little bit on that last fact because most Africans believe that insurance never pays. You buy it, but there's always an excuse not to pay you when something happens. Well, we actually work. We've paid 36 million dollars, so it works, and we've helped so many uh, people. But this is not enough. Again, as the president of AFDB was saying, we need more countries to sign on to these policies. The more of them that sign on, the bigger the pool, the lower will come the cost of insurance. 
But if they don't sign on, then it makes it a little more expensive. Now, let me just say one or two things about challenges and opportunities, and then I'll close. Our whole system is built up around a model called the African Risk View. It's the technical en engine behind the African Risk Capacity. And it's the first of its kind for Africa. This software application provides a transparent system to estimate crop losses, the impact of the, of the event on populations, food security, and so on. And it's, as I said, it stands at the forefront of drought risk modeling globally. It's new. So we are very proud that, again, we've been able to innovate this with the help of the World Food Program. I should have mentioned that this whole program was also backed by the World Food Program, the Rockefeller Foundation, that provided the technical capacity and so on to make the model work. But the model is not perfect and we're still working on it. So it's a big opportunity. It's also a challenge to keep calibrating it. We've now gotten to the point where we can customize it, not only to na national uh, parameters, but also to regional parameters. We've now got a panel of experts worldwide that help us to review and try to shape the model uh, to make it work better. And so um, we have a couple of other challenges. One of them is payment of premiums. I know as a former finance minister, it's not easy when you put payment of insurance premium in the budget. It's not always supported by your parliament. So we also want to reach out by parliamentarians for them to know that this is one instrument we can use in building resilience. So payment of premium is sometimes difficult, year in, year out. But with the new facility to be developed by the African Development Bank, we think that we can help to overcome this problem. And we are going to hear a little bit more about this facility as we move on in the discussion. But the bank has undertaken that any country that requests support for the payment of premiums can have access to this facility for five years, three years, whatever the case may be. They have to co-finance it, of course. Um, but this will give a little bit of relief to finance ministers and so that they don't have to go back every year to the budget. But it is still your own money because it still has to be repaid. So we maintain that faithfulness that we are financing this ourselves. It's not through donor support. It's not through grants. Um, some of it could be grants for countries that cannot afford it. But basically, most of it is through our own budgets. We've had a couple of issues and challenges due to sometimes when we have an event and the model doesn't trigger. This is something we call basis risk, where there's an event on the ground, but the model is showing that it's not significant enough to trigger payment. Countries, we're working with them to explain what this means in insurance terms, because it's not always understood. And we've had one or two of these cases. We are developing a facility and a policy to deal with this so that when this occurs, we have another means of working with the countries. So I just wanted to mention a few issues. Now, on our continent, this instrument is really, really important because it's one more in the arsenal of insurance. Africa is one of the least underinsured, or one of, sorry, the most underinsured continents in the world. One country, South Africa, accounts for 80% of all premiums paid on the continent. And penetration is so low. In South Africa, it's 13% as a percentage of, percentage of, his, of GDP. 13% in South Africa, 3% in Kenya, 0.3% in Nigeria. We are just very underinsured on the continent. So having this African risk capacity provides us another instrument, market-based, that helps to bring the culture of insurance into our tools for managing our economies. So that's what I want to say. I want to say that we have a partnership going on this issue. We want to urge all of you, whether you're finance ministers or finance officials from the countries, whether you're partners who want to work with us, to please come together so that we can tackle 
this and provide our continent with one more tool which can build resilience. We are tired of seeing all those photographs of African children with flies in their eyes because there was a drought or a flood and their country could not cope. We are tired of seeing all those livestock lying carcasses. Isn't that what people see when you ask someone about Africa? The first thing they'll talk about is children with flies dying of hunger, cattle with all bones. It's about time that those things, that those images were removed. And we need to develop one of these instruments to work on these issues and remove those images from the face of the world. Thank you very much. That's what ARC is about. Dr. Ngozi okonjo Wela, Chairperson of the African Risk Capacity Governing Board. Up next, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dominic Zilla, the Director General, Multilateral Affairs, the Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, the Federal Republic of Germany, sir. Thank you very much, and uh, I'd like to specifically uh, thank the President for, in his introductory remarks, taking up the uh, fact that while Africa is most affected by climate change, by droughts, by flooding, um, Africa does not really contribute to climate change such a lot. And therefore, um, I was part of, of some of the international negotiation processes, be it the SDGs, be it the Addis Agenda, and also a bit involved in the climate agenda. I would like to see the African voice also being raised in G77's negotiations, because G77 has not always taken a very conducive stance on climate change issues in these negotiation processes. Because there are also member countries who are producing fossil fuels, and there are member countries whose business case includes using up much more fossil fuels than the African countries do. So make the African voice heard also inside G77 and tell other G77 countries what you are doing goes to the detriment of Africa. Because prevention is better than mitigation and is better than insurance. Coming to insurance, definitely Germany is very much in favor of what you are doing. Very much in favor of your attempt to insure all African countries if possible, or at least the 30 that have declared interest in the African uh, risk facility, because you mentioned it. Um, we have to pool risks in order to really create a functioning insurance schemes. And the more countries are involved, the more risks are pooled, the more widely distributed also the benefits will be in the end, the less costly it will get, and the more of an insurance scheme, a real insurance scheme, we will see. So we can only support this very much. You know that we created under the German G20 presidency, together with the COP23, the Insure Resilience Initiative, and what you're doing is very much in line with what we try to create in Bonn in November uh, 2015, uh, 20, 2017. Sorry. And I wish you all the success um, that you need in order to make this a big, big success story. And I'll still be part of it next year and the years after. Thank you. Right. We're now going to move to our panel discussion. And I would like the following people, please, to come up. Um, if I could be joined by the Honorable Ben Botolo, the Alternative Governor Secretary to the Treasury, the Republic of Malawi. Governor Botolo, if you could come here, please, sir. If I could also ask the Honorable Lanman Dibba, Minister of Forestry, Environment, Climate Change and Natural Resources from the Gambia to come up and join us. We're also joined by DG Rafa, who will be joining us from the Ministry of Planning, the Republic of Niger. Thank you very much, sir. And you can take seats because we're going to be sitting here for a long time. So make yourselves comfortable. Thank you. And then also Sibri Tapsoba, please, who's the Transition Support Facility Coordinator at ARC. Thank you very much. Right, so we are going to do something slightly different today. It's going to be a very interactive panel. And we're going to, I've coined a new term. We're going to have a horizontal panel and we're going to have a vertical panel. So once we have got input from what we're going to call our tier one countries, and those are the countries that identify the issue at hand, the need for insurance when it comes to sustainable climate and disaster risk mitigation, 
followed by tier two countries, and those, com those are the countries that also realize the need uh, to mitigate against the risk and the importance of insurance, but those are the countries that are also experiencing financial difficulties. And we're going to bring them to the table as part of the discussion. And of course, then, the African Development Bank, who is working across the African continent to implement solutions and uh, working with the challenges that are being experienced by the countries on the ground. So I am hoping that you will rise to the occasion. We will allow also um, inclusive comments from the audience. So if you do have burning questions at any stage, please put up your hand and we will deploy a roving mic. I'm now going to start with Governor Batolo and get a sense of Malawi's experience with the African risk capacity, sir. If you could take us through your story. Uh, you have benefited from a payout of uh, $8.5 million, and that was for the 2014-2015 year. Could you give us a sense? You have obviously been involved from the beginning. Just give us a sense of your experience. And again, we're looking for honest commentary, and it's going to be a robust discussion. Governor Batolo. It was quite a, 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 a good experience, uh, which we went through uh, in Malawi. Malawi was one of the uh, first uh, countries to uh, uh, join uh, ACT uh, uh, as a group. Um, two issues which I want to mention, three issues. Uh, climate change is real, and the region is getting affected either by drought or too much rainfall or earthquakes. So we need to take uh, remedial measures. Hence, the uh, 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 African Union coming up with this uh, institute, uh, uh, African Risk Capacity. Uh, in Malawi, we had that experience. Uh, within those two years, we had uh, too much rainfall, and uh, again, we had the drought. Uh, at, the same, at the same time. When you're one of the pioneers, uh, you suffer sometimes uh, quite a lot because you have not, you have not seen you, how the model is going to reflect uh, or how it's going to respond to the need of the people. Uh, in the case of Malawi, it's possible that one region can have too much rainfall and the other region have a drought. It's, it's very possible. So at that particular point in time, we found out that the southern part of Malawi, where there's a lot of people, most population uh, reside there, they had a drought there. And uh, in the northern part of Malawi, uh, there was too much rainfall. On the average, you'll find that Malawi, according to that model, was not fitting very well. We, needed, we went into the negotiations, and the uh, act did come to payout. They did as a given that payout. Well, I think that's very important, that's very important. Uh, as uh, Dr. Okonjoela was saying earlier, is that the perception uh, across Africa in many instances is that if you pay insurance premiums, there's always an excuse not to pay out, and that is not the situation here. You received $8.5 million, Governor we, Batolo. We received $8.5 million, and uh, uh, definitely subsequent, you'd find that that now model has been improved. Now it can take even regional sensitivities, which is very good for all of us because a, a bigger country, any country, Malawi is just a small country, but long, uh, uh, long, so it may have that variation. So bigger countries may have, again, variation. So African models should take into that, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, our, uh, our management to look into the sensitivity of the countries and into the regional sensitivity, which we need uh, to have. Um, after payout, we did whatever it takes uh, to distribute or where those resources uh, are needed to the most affected and the most vulnerable people uh, in, the re in, in, in our country. And you did uh, supply both rice and cash payouts to the people on the ground. Could you just quickly take me through that process? I think, again, it's important to know how you distributed the funds that you received. When the funds uh, arrived, there was, again, uh, a cash uh, uh, payout. Uh, and as well as a commodity, in this case, uh, uh, rice uh, and, and maize and some uh, cereals uh, uh, pay out. We did that one because we were working with a, a group uh, of United Nations, uh, WFP, and we had a team of NGOs, uh, government officials, uh, uh, development partners formed up a team. We have got clusters. So when it came, it just went into that kind of mode. And those people who were on the cash uh, basis, they had their cash and they went to buy. 
uh, depending on their uh, uh, need. And those people who were in really need of food, uh, the food was distributed to them. Governor Batola, thank you very much. Now I'm going to ask if we do have representatives from uh, Senegal, Ghana, Burkina Faso in the room. If you are here, could you signal your presence? Could I please get a, a roving mic deployed? And would you like to come up to, to the podium? So we'd very much like to hear of Senegal's experience, again, as one of the tier one countries uh, that has been involved in African risk capacity since the beginning, also so receiving a payout. Um, so if I could perhaps ask you to just give your, your sense of how you've experienced uh, the African risk capacity building initiative that you have obviously been involved in. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Ibrahim Akan. I'm the CEO of the Sovereign Mineral Fund of Senegal. Unfortunately, my colleague, the head of delegation of Senegal, is in another meeting. So he asked We appreciate you making the time to come, sir. Thank so you. So he insisted a lot to come and speak with you, uh, keeping in mind that I'm not the right person to speak very, uh, in, very in detail in what, we, what happened in Senegal. So, I asked him what I have to say. And he told me, okay, just say that we received some money last year. Just okay, some money? Let's say was, it, wasn't it in the magnitude of over $16 million? Yes, 16, 16 point something exactly. uh, million US dollar uh, we received last year. Exactly. I think let's have a round of applause again and on the fact that insurance actually does pay out. And, and, uh, he was, let's say, he, he seemed surprised that we, he received this money uh, because uh, the money we were to contribute was really a small, very small portion of this. Uh, this showed that this mechanism of insurance is I'm something that this. fits sure our need. And, and we expect uh, when we pay this contribution, we will never need to receive this 16 point something. But unfortunately, we need this 16 point something to pay something to our agriculture people who are facing this drought, mainly in the north of Senegal. And uh, we have this issue that we believe that is really a very good mechanism. Brilliant. And you are committed to the process going forward. You will continue to pay your premium, sir? Uh, and I asked him, uh, have you already paid this year? <laughs> and he answered, uh, we have in our budget written down the amount that we are going to pay. Unfortunately, it's not paid yet, but it will be. So that's the message I have to... Thank you very much. I think a very important message that the money has been provisioned for in the budget, uh, a worthy premium to be paying from the national budget. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, the Gambia is uh, part of the few countries that has made payment towards the African risk uh, capacity. In the Sorry, and, and let me just rectify that. So what I'm saying is that the situation going forward is that the, the payments are now being discussed in terms of looking for assistance from the AFDB. So I'm not saying, in terms of our two, tier two countries, that these are countries that have not come to the party. They have been involved and made payments, but we are now at a juncture as to how do you continue to make those payments going forward. And I, I um, apologize for any misunderstanding, but it's certainly about what happens now in terms of the premiums going forward. And as far as I understand it, the Gambia is looking to the African Development Bank to get assistance for the premiums going forward. Actually, that's, that's what I just uh, indicated. We have uh, an ongoing project, uh, which is a resilience project called uh, P2RS. It's a regional African Development Bank-led uh, project. And uh, we were engaged, and in the process, uh, we made sure that uh, we reallocated resources. Uh, we uh, did our logs and made sure that uh, we made the $500,000 payment uh, about two months ago. Uh, and going forward, we are now taking into consideration the fact that, you know, we need to be doing this uh, periodically 
and it is going to feature in our budgets, you know, going forward, because uh, part of our agricultural portfolio already has about three projects from the World Bank, African Development Bank, to the uh, IFAD, which are all dealing with uh, climate change issues and uh, resilience is one of our main. And so government is doing a lot of investment in terms of uh, climate resilience, especially when it comes to food security uh, of our main staple crop, rice crop. Uh, you would find out that uh, we are doing a lot of investment in irrigation. Now, what happens is that uh, we have tidal irrigation where we, uh, the irrigation depends on the ebb and flow of the River Gambia. But when floods happen, uh, the waters normally bust the uh, banks of the uh, uh, perimeter dikes, you know, that are covering the uh, irrigation perimeters. And so what happens is that uh, the double crop that we are targeting during the year, a dry season crop and a rainy season crop, all come under risk. The dry season crop we lose, and the rainy season crop we cannot get because the fields are flooded. And so measures have to be put in place to make sure that the huge investment that we are doing for food security is protected. So let me just understand, and again, I'm going to ask you just to reiterate, your contributions in terms of the premiums have been made from the national budget. You have been in from the beginning in terms of supporting uh, African risk capacity. At this current juncture, you're still provisioning in the budget for the premiums. You, you aren't experiencing fiscal, fiscal constraints at the moment and, and looking um, at uh, assistance for those premiums. I just need to, to clarify that. Yeah, actually what I indicated is that uh, this first payment has been made from the P2RS project, uh, given that uh, we have budgetary concern. But going forward... Can you break that down, PT? P2RS uh, is one of the uh, African Development Bank regional projects. Uh, it's a resilience, uh, pro uh, building resilience for... Uh, so it's a security. capacity building, yeah. exactly. It's called uh, building resilience for food security in the Sahelian, the Sahelian countries. And it is out of... Those uh, resources that we reallocated, about half a million dollars, which payment has already been made to this. Uh, but going forward, as I indicated, there will be budgetary allocations to make sure that you know, premiums are paid regularly, given what I, uh, in, I, I said already, that uh, it's a reality that you know, our investments are being threatened. By I also that. want to understand, uh, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo-Wele, earlier spoke about the software applicable and the process that you can, if you can stay with me for a moment. So can you talk to me about the, the software applications in terms of assessing risk and working with you as the government on the ground to, to understand your risk profile and uh, your sensitivity to such disasters? Has that been a good experience? Um, so far, like I said, uh, it's just the beginning. Uh, as far as the Gambia is concerned, uh, we're uh, too far with the program as yet. And so all the uh, instruments have not actually been uh, put in place, you know, so to speak. But uh, I think we have already demonstrated that uh, we are committed to make sure that uh, this uh, African insurance uh, risk uh, capacity uh, thing is uh, entrenched in our climate resilience uh, measures. Thank you very much. Sibri, I think we're building here, it, it, obviously. The, the need for the insurance is important. And I think we've had each of the panelists express the importance uh, for each of their respective countries in terms of mitigating against disasters. But the, the payment is the issue in question for a number of countries that are experiencing fiscal constraints. And as DG Rafa has pointed out, when security concerns start becoming an issue, you have to look at budget allocations and you may prioritize other issues over the, the, the grudge purchase that we would say from an insurance perspective. So I'm gonna ask you to come in, Sibri, from a African Development Bank perspective. Again, you're working with this on the ground. You've heard the respective panelists. We are gonna hear from other members in the audience, but take it away. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, let me start by saying that um, this is an important issue for the African Development Bank. You've heard our president. Um, I'm also coming uh, from the countries 
that are classified as fragile. And uh, if you look at the list of the countries that have already signed the ARC agreement, of the 32, 16 are classified as fragile. So this is an important concern for us. And I think the recurring disasters that every year, year after year, uh, um, those countries are confronted with calls for support. So, um, but whatever I'm, I'm going to be saying could also apply to countries that are not in the fragile state's capacity and could use the African Development Bank ADF allocation uh, to, to handle this. So whatever we we, we we be talking about today has to be accepted and agreed by the countries so that we can move forward. And I want to make that clear. Right. There's another thing that I'd like to bring into the discussion is the capacity building and the reduced premiums if you've got more people coming into the pool. And I think that's what we are trying to achieve today. So sorry to jump in there, but I, I need to make us move to that as well. Thank you, Sabine. Uh, no, exactly. So, so what we are saying is that at the end of the day, um, the countries that are facing this situation will have to find the money. And in most instances, uh, the drought happens when they don't have those resources. Remember, those are countries that are already affected by fragility. And then in the middle of the course, yesterday we were with the Minister of Somalia uh, talking to the President, and the President referred to ARC and said, well, uh, we know that you are going through the drought. And the Minister said, no, this year we don't have drought. We have flooding. So instead of drought, Somalia went out of drought uh, two years ago and last year. This year it is flooding. So it's perpetual, continuous disasters, and we need to find a solution. And, and I think that's why the ARC is so important, but we can only do it with the countries. So our proposal on the table, and the minister is here, Minister Ngozi, is that we want to bring these 20 African countries that are considered as fragile to agree on a premium that is affordable, but that we then bring in a reasonable amount of money so that if one or two or three countries are hit in a year, they can get considerable response from ARC. And that makes sense, so, and that will also provide them with the resources to solve the problem. You know, I was um, in one of those countries I visited recently was Burkina Faso, right? Uh, Burkina Faso is not a fragile country, but they've been faced with drought. Really serious issue, and they're looking for $2.6 million to actually be able to buy the crops and so on, and then bridge that, 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 that period, right? So if Burkina Faso had paid, I would assume that they would be getting. But this is also true for other countries. So we want to facilitate that process by putting in place that um, agreed common pool of resources so that ARC can then respond efficiently. What are the barriers to getting all those voices around the table? I mean, we talk over and over about Africans creating solutions for Africa. This is one of those very solutions. So what are the challenges of getting all the voices around the table? And I can see Niger's agreeing with me. They're saying, come on, let's get together and make this happen. And uh, instead of when it does happen, having to approach the developed world and, and try and solicit solutions from them. So Sibri, if you can comment. We don't have a special pot of money sitting aside that we can use. So whatever we want to do has to be agreed upon by the countries. So um, it is their money. We allocated the money to them. I know how much have been spent by those countries and what is left, but I don't have the liberty of taking that money and then putting it in ARC. So we need the agreement. So we are, we, are, we, we are starting a dialogue with the countries where we want to convince them of the value of actually paying the premium so that they can get those results. But it has to be a decision of the countries in agreement. Otherwise, if I could, I would make a decision today that I'm taking three million per country and then the issue will be solved. But I can't do that. Okay? DG Rafa, you want to yeah, come in? Yeah, yeah, no, no, but let, let me also quickly say that for those countries 
it is not loans, it is grants. So I want to reassure the public here that if we take the money, it's not going to be lending that money to the countries, it will be providing them with grants. Because you do not want to borrow to pay insurance premiums uh, and have to pay interest. Is, is that what you're saying? Those grants are not loans? Yeah, no, well, because they benefit from grants. But if they didn't have grants and they only have loans, they will borrow, right? But in this case, they benefit from grants from the transition support facility. I do just want to throw it back. Before I go to closing comments, I am cognizant of time. We've got seven minutes, and I will come back to my panel for, for closing comments. Uh, I do just want to ask the DG, Ark, if you would like to say anything, sir. Thank you. And uh, if you would like to say anything, uh, ma'am. Thank you very much. And um, I, I just wanted to come back to the context a little bit. You know, myself, I spend my life in trying to support agriculture. And trying to support, most of the time in Africa, you support rain-fed agriculture. And we, all of us, World Bank, African Development Bank, IFAD, we, we designed this project. And then we don't, although we have somewhere some kind of risk mitigation measures, but we really don't have the right response to this kind of drought, serious drought disasters or flood disasters. And we invest three, four, five years the, fifth, the, the third year or the fourth year, there is a big drought, and everything we have invested goes out. It's destroyed completely. So, of course, the immediate reaction is Yasin, exactly what you said now is the response. I am, we are building the strategy for the next three years. How do we do to make sure that what we are investing on is not going astray? Now, Africa created the African risk capacity. And our partners came and helped us to set up our insurance company. And everybody's looking at us to move very quickly to produce results. And we know also, you just spoke about economy of scale, then bigger we are, then lower is the premium, and then better it is for, for the company and for everybody. But the thing is that you have to prime the pump in a context where Insurance is not very, really something even we donors are taking care of, <laughs> seriously, leave alone the governments themselves. So you have time to sensitize, time to build the capacities, and also time to put in place the right public policies. Thank you very much, I'd now like uh, Nolika, Arc Limited CEO, to uh, comment. And then we will hear from Tony Nyong on the Green Climate Funds. And then I'm going to ask you each for 30 seconds in terms of the messaging that our panel would like to leave the audience with. Uh, so, ma'am, it is on. You can go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for being so patient with us. I think it's... Um, wonderful that we've got the audience that we have today and I'd like to thank the AFDB for arranging. Um, I know we're pressed for time, so I think I'd like to just put a couple of points or a few points on the table. One, it is insurance, it is parametric insurance, it is new, not just for the Africa region, but for the global world in general. It is a tough decision to make because there are trade-offs being made of the national budgets that are already constrained. And it is a question of what is the value for money, as a gentleman from uh, Mozambique, I think, just said. At the end of the day, it is an African-bred, African-owned solution. And I think that in itself gives us, gives us and behooves us to give it some thought. Secondly, I like the concept of the pri private partnerships. We have come to the point where this conversation has got to come not only just as a public fiscal decision, but also how do the private sector stakeholders who are benefiting from operating in these countries able to come to the table and support in a sustainable manner. And then thirdly, I would like to remind existing members and potential members that with each premium payment, you are acquiring a part of the ownership of this company such that at the end, when we do pay out in 2034, our founding partners, the UK DFID, German BMZ through KFW, this will be a mutual insurance company that will be owned by the African sovereigns. So effectively, you're building a sovereign fund to manage climate change-related disasters in this continent. 
Thank you very I much, Nolika, Arc Limited uh, CEO. And now, if we can hear from Tony Nyong, funds. Uh, Tony, if we can... Uh, yeah, I'm here. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Let me lay out a few points. The first is that African countries are paying so much for these issues, you know, for the disasters. Either they're paying directly, as we can see, we're told, or they are paying indirectly through those enormous losses that they are making. And so to be able to finance this initiative, we need something very innovative. And what we're seeing today through the financed uh, 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 project with the bank does two things. One, it does not create dependency. Two, there is an exit strategy that we know when the bank intervenes or any other person intervenes, it won't be forever and we step out. So we have gone to the Green Climate Fund and they say we love this project. They really love it and want to finance it. But incidentally, they cannot pay premiums because their fear is that the Latin American countries, the, uh, uh, all the other countries in the Caribbean that are exposed to this will also come. The other African countries will be on their neck, and they are not set up for that. So what we need to do is how do we put some of our resources into this to pay the premiums, and then the Green Climate Fund says every other thing, the capacity building, we will take it up. And that way, we know we're going to finance this. So as we sit, we are just waiting for African countries to show some commitments that they w are willing to put some of their money in. This is a digressive payment that over time, we would have built their capacities enough that they no longer need the GCF funding on a continuous basis. Neither do they need the African Development Bank funding. Their capacities would have been enhanced that they can do it and everybody goes on. But you do want to see skin in the game. Definitely. Right. Okay. So on that note, let's go to our closing uh, panel and uh, just a very short comment in terms of, and now let's build on the momentum. Remember, this has been in the making for a long time. You now either go forward, you collaborate, you get the scale that you need to make sure that the premiums are of a suitable magnitude, that they are affordable, and that will only come through the scale. You've heard, once you put skin in the game as African countries, you will find other players that will come to the party, and then you have viable solution in terms of an African solution. Uh, that, And as you mentioned, it will be a global solution ultimately, uh, but uh, this is where we need to start. But it, it's, uh, it's almost a break, make or break. Right now, the commitment needs to be here, and you need champions. Governor Oh, thank you. Um, ARC is not a, a, a potential solver of climate change or the problems affecting drought or disaster. It's a partner when that disaster or flooding uh, has occurred. A friend in need is a friend indeed. Timely coming, whenever the disaster is available, it will reflect quite positively on the institution. A friend in need is a friend indeed. Governor Batolo, thank you very much. Uh, if we can hear from the Gambia, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. I think the case has been succinctly made by all the uh, speakers here, from the president to uh, Minister Konye uh, Kuela. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the name rightly. And of course, uh, all the Dwayans, you know, we've worked together at uh, IFAD on so many uh, agriculture projects. And the amount of investment we are pumping into these projects is so much. Uh, we are thinking of all ways of uh, making sure that resilience is built in. Um, it shouldn't be so difficult, as uh, Mr. Sivri has said, whereby we negotiate part of the grants that are given to us is actually paid in at the beginning as premium as the Gambia has done in the case of this uh, building res resilience for food insecurity in the Sahel project. So I am imploring on all other countries to follow suit um, and make sure that our investments that we have made in terms of uh, agricultural development are protected and we have a fallback option and also actually have 
contributing to the idea of the private sector coming in, knowing that very well, that uh, the public-private partnership uh, is a big deal as far as uh, agriculture is concerned. And so everybody should have something on the table as far as uh, this climate risk uh, capacity thing is concerned. D. Rafa, Sibri, if I could give a final comment to you from the African Development Bank, sir. Yes, uh, uh, three points are very shortly. Um, first one is sustainability, exit strategy, and of course, how do we maneuver the process to maybe go into an insurance, but also reinsurance process. We, we need to talk about that with the ARC group. Second is an appeal to the countries to uh, take, well, they should agree so that we can take a very small portion of their money and have a group insurance that we can then discuss with, uh, with ARC. And, you know, of course, uh, it has to be understood that this cannot be year after year after year for the next 10 years. We need to look at the, uh, at the next strategy. And then the last point is that for us, ARC is an African solution for African countries facing disaster. I think there's time to discuss, but there's also time to move on. So let's move on. <laughs> so let's move on. And just in conclusion, I've spent the last 10 years under the CNBC Africa brand uh, traipsing across the African continent, uh, going to the World Economic Forum in Davos, debating these issues, the Milken Institute in Los Angeles, and we are seeing progress happen. I am very, very encouraged by the tangible solutions that we are seeing on the ground across the African continent. You've got the free trade zone coming to fruition. Our job as a media player is to monitor the promises made. And this is a role that we can play in the ARC story going forward. So you have the commitment. Let us monitor it, let us measure it, and let us see this African solution turning into a very, very viable solution that Africa can stand proud behind. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. And that's all on the show. Many thanks to you for watching. I am Christy Cole.